Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and on today's episode, I'm going to be talking about 10 things that older adults need to know before having elective surgery. The decision to have elective surgery is one that a lot of older adults and their families will face, whether it's related to a chronic condition like heart disease, it could be in response to a cancer, or it could be restorative, meaning that the problem won't be totally fixed, but it could relieve pain or improve function or quality of life in some way. There are a lot of things to consider before having elective surgery, from the cost of the procedure to who's going to provide caregiving afterwards during your recovery period. And in addition to the normal conversations, exams, and tests that will, um, that will be done to clear you for surgery, I want to share a few additional things that you need to know. And this is based on the American College of, Nur of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program and the American Geriatric Society's Best Practice Guidelines. I know that's a mouthful, but I'm going to include the link um, in the blog and in the, this description below for this episode. And what I wanted to do today was share a few things that they recommend, um, because most surgical offices are going to require thorough lab work, heart, lung, and kidney function tests. But if you're over 65 or you have a loved one um, who's going to be having elective surgery in that same age range, I want to be sure that you and that your surgical team know the following, because many of these have been linked to a higher risk of death or complications after surgery for an older adult. So number one, know the person's pre-surgery cognitive ability. Um, this is important because I've told my students forever, you can be an older adult and have been on the golf course the day before and things were going great. And then you have surgery and you end up, you know, there's something that's happened during the surgery and you can look very old and frail. The point is you're not supposed to stay looking that way. We're supposed to help you um, get through recovery. But if you make the assumption of, well, they're just old, First of all, that's ageist, and so I've, that's definitely a no-no, um, but it's something that happens to a lot of older adults. So you want to be sure that your surgical team knows what that person's cognitive ability was prior to the surgery, because you should be returned to baseline. You should be back at that level um, after surgery. Two screening tests that can be done by your provider are the mini mental state exam or the mini cog exam. These um, are basic questions around, do you know who you are, where you are, and what day of the week it is? Um, so it's testing your orientation to person, place, and time. It's going to test um, your recall ability, your short and longer term memory, as well as your executive function test through what's called a clock drawing test. How well can you put the numbers on the face of a clock and draw the hands um, there? So it's important for your providers to know what you could do before, because after your surgery, you should be back at that baseline status. Number two, depressed or not. And this is a really simple one to screen for. Um, people who have been depressed before surgery, they've had, um, there's been an association with a higher likelihood of dying after surgery and, and or the person spending more days in the hospital. So two quick questions to ask for this. In the past 12 months, for two weeks or more, have you felt sad or blue? Or have you lost interest in activities that typically are enjoyable? So two quick questions. Again, these are all screening questions. They're not diagnostic, which means um, it's, it's meant to begin the conversation. And then from there, talk with your provider about what else um, should be done. Because with an elective surgery, you have time to plan for these things. And uh, with an emergency surgery, you don't. So number three, is there any alcohol or substance abuse or dependence issues? Again, increased risk of death and complications after surgery. So the four questions that can be asked are, um, this part of the CAGE questionnaire. The C stands for, has anyone asked you to cut back on your drinking? The A stands for, um, have you been annoyed when someone asked you to cut back on your drinking? The G stands for, do you feel guilty about um, your drinking or your drug use? And the E stands for, do you wake up in the morning um, for an eye opener? So do you wake up in the morning and take a drink or do you wake up in the morning and, and take the drug, um, the substance that you're using? Number four, know your risk of post-surgical delirium and your family needs to know how to recognize it. So um, some of the major things that increase your risk for this are being over the age of 70, um, also taking multiple medications or being given something in the hospital like a benzodiazepine or an antihistamine. Those things can cause delirium. Delirium can be hypoactive or hyperactive. 
And I've done other episodes where I've talked about um, these two different types of delirium. The hypoactive one tends to not get a lot of attention because the person is just lying in the bed and they're not bothering anyone. But it should be recognized that that's a problem as much as the person who's, you know, tearing the beds off, the sheets off the bed, they're tearing their IVs out. That's called hyperactive delirium. It tends to get a lot of attention. The problem is they might be given a benzodiazepine and then that's going to revert result in the hypoactive delirium. And you could see a mix. So, so people can be one way you know, for a couple hours during the day and then switch. But anytime your loved one has a feeling that you're just not right, that needs to be investigated. And so anytime a family member or a staff member would come up to me and say, you know, Mrs. So-and-so is just not right today. It's like, okay, we need to go figure out what's going on because delirium is reversible and it's going to slow down your recovery um, if it's not addressed quickly. Number five, know your functional status and your history or risk of falls. So for functional status, this has to do with what we refer to as the activities of daily living. So can the person get themselves dressed? Can they take a bath? Can they get out of a chair or get out of their bed by themselves? Can they prepare their own meals or do their own shopping? And so knowing what that person's functional status was before is important. Um, and for a fall risk assessment, that's a simple question of, have you fallen in the past 12 years? This is probably the, the one screening question that I think a lot of providers are doing um, really well on because I've, I've even been asked it the past you know, 10 years. The last screening test for this would be a time to get up and go. And this is where the person's sitting in a chair that doesn't have arms. They have to stand up, walk you know, five, six feet, turn around, come back and sit back down, being able to do that in less than 15 seconds. Because if it takes you more than 15 seconds or you have issues with walking and balance, all of those things mean that person's at high risk for falls. Number six, is the person malnourished? So one indicator of malnourishment could be an unintentional weight loss of 10 pounds or more in the past year. Um, there's some lab work that can give us some ideas, including a pre-albumin and albumin level. And then there's a body mass index calculation that can be done that takes your height and your weight and comes up with that BMI to determine if the person is either over or underweight. But either of those can result in negative surgical outcomes. So just because a person's overweight doesn't mean they're nourished, nor does having a low body weight mean that they are malnourished. So being sure that your um, the lab work is checked and those um, things have been done. Number seven, what is the person's frailty score? So frailty, again, is defined by that unintentional weight loss of more than 10 pounds in the past year. Um, that's often the, the biggest indicator for me as a clinician that we need to go back to number one and check the person's uh, cognitive ability. But for the second thing with the frailty score is a decreased grip strength, uh, which is the inability to like open a jar of peanut butter um, or ho hold a, um, a pan that they've cooked with for a long time. And when that normally wasn't a problem, um, self-reported poor energy or low endurance, or you notice that during the week, they don't expend a lot of energy. So this is someone who may be doing a lot of sitting. And if they are up and walking, it's going to be slow. So slowing down um, your how fast you walk and that grip strength, to me, are the two biggest things. But the weight loss uh, plays into this also. Number eight, be sure you take a medication list and make sure that all medications have a diagnosis. So any non-essential medications should be dis discontinued prior to surgery. So, and then you also need to know what medications can be taken on the day of surgery. So it's a great idea to take a list of your medications. Actually, uh, we recommend what's called a brown bag approach. Take every medication, every supplement, every vitamin, stick it in a big brown paper bag and take it to your provider and say, here's all the stuff um, that I take because all of those things can interact with the anesthesia and any other medications they may give you while you're in the hospital. So do your brown bag approach and your provider should be reviewing all those medications to make sure that there's a supporting diagnosis for them um, and review them against the BEERS criteria, which is a list that's been um, developed of high risk medications for adults over the age of 65. And, um, and through that, to figure out what medications should be discontinued how soon they should be discontinued before surgery, and then when could you resume any of those, and which ones do you need to just completely get rid of. Number nine, treatment goals and expectations. This is a big one uh, because you need to have a discussion about not only the patient's preferences and expectations, but also the family's um, because 
you know, people that think they're going to have surgery and it's going to cure their pain. Um, if they don't get that result, that's going to be disappointing if it was meant to be um, a pain reducing, not a pain eliminating type of surgery. You also need to know if rehabilitation is going to be required for surgery. And if it is, where is the preferred location for that to take place? Does it need to be in you know, a skilled nursing home? Can it be done at home with home health um, therapy? Can you do it on an outpatient basis? Or do you need to do like an inpatient acute rehabilitation um, facility? And there are criteria for each of those. So be sure that you've had a discussion with your provider about where the best discharge location is going to be. And a lot of those answers depend on the questions that we just talked about. Number 10, final number 10, um, take your paperwork because your providers are going to need to know who's going to be involved in your care and what to do in case something bad happens. So be sure that you're going to take any copies or take a copy of all of your legal paperwork that you may need. So this means the person's advanced directives, um, which could be a living will. It could also be kind of their code status, whether they're a full code or no code as well as who are the designated decision makers, uh, so such as the healthcare power of attorney. And copies of those should also be in the person's medical record. If you have any questions about other things that you might need to know related to surgery or um, other helpful tips that you'd like to share, please drop them in the comment box or post them on social media where you found this. And if you're listening um, in the podcast platform to the audio version, there's also a place um, that you can drop those comments. So. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor. And if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out. In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast and helps us move towards an age-friendly world. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab, and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.